Hey everyone, welcome back to the Mark Loeffler Experience. Uh, we have a great guest today. We have Elizabeth Kelly on with us. Uh, they own and manage over 400 units. They have done probably as many or maybe a slightly less rent to owns than I've done over my career. They flip property, they've wholesale properties, they coach. Um, oh geez, who knows what else they do? I mean, listen, guys, I tell you one thing they don't do though, they will not do Russian dancing if we get over a thousand subscribers by the end of July. So guys, if you haven't, definitely subscribe, turn on that notification bell, and like this video for Liz, okay? Thanks, Mark, appreciate that. My pleasure. So tell me about this Russian dancing thing again. Right, so I had Alex Powell on, I think you know Alex, right? I do, yeah. yeah. The, the Greater Hamilton or Greater, I don't remember what it is, but GAIN, G-H-A-I-N network. And they've seen me at functions and I can Russian dance. So he said, what number would you have to hit to Russian dance on YouTube? And I said, I would have to be at a thousand subscribers by the end of July to do Russian dancing on YouTube. Okay, and where are you now? 558. Oh, you'll hit that, no problem. So we have 442 to go. Well, it depends. I mean, like I gained a lot when I did a CMHC video that had almost 1500 views. Um, but my typical views for stuff like this is two to 400. So it just depends on, on how that looks. But I appreciate any help that you can give. Absolutely. I'll definitely share with my friends and encourage everyone to like it. That's awesome. I want to see you Russian dance. There you go. All right. Well, let's make it happen. I, I'm excited to do it if and when we hit 1,000. Exactly. When you hit a thousand. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, all right. Well, so where, where do you want to start? Do you want to talk, start property management, coaching, rent to owns, fires, multi-unit buildings, uh, flips, wholesaling? Like you've done it all. I mean, you're a bit like me. We, we've yes. kind of done it all. Yeah. And, and, you know, I was thinking back, um, we've known each other a long time, oh, like yeah. 11 years. Yeah. I remember meeting up with you when we were starting our Rich Dad courses and we had that networking dinner and we met up with you then. And that was where we were friends on Facebook already, but um, I met you for the first time then. And it's been awesome just to sort of see your evolution as an investor, because most of us, you know, when we're starting out, we tend to start out with smaller buildings. And, you know, over the years, you can see you sort of evolved and you've gone for bigger buildings. Um, we buy bigger buildings. So it's, it's really interesting to watch everybody's journey because everybody's journey is different. And I think a lot of people make the mistake of sort of comparing themselves to you know what they see other people posting on Facebook or you know on Instagram or whatever it is and everybody's journey is really unique and I think it's important to remember that you should be comparing yourself to yourself and not to you know what somebody else is doing the next you know street over or the next town over yeah I mean I tell everybody don't compare your insides to other people's outsides and the other thing, I was on one of the message boards on Facebook. Do they even call them message boards? What are they? Groups? I don't even know. Anyway, see, now I'm dating myself. I'm old. And, <laughs> and, and they're like, well, Mark, you're so successful. And I'm like, yeah. And I started 16 years ago yeah. with a duplex. And I bought like three or four properties my first year and basically killed myself and like didn't buy for another two years after that, just trying to figure everything else out after that, right? The buying was easy. And then the rest was like, oh, you know, you got to manage these things. You got to talk to tenants. It's like, oh man, this is a lot of work, right? I think um, a lot of people, when they get into real estate investing, they just kind of assume, okay, I'm going to buy investment properties. And they don't realize what they're actually doing is starting a business. Mm -hmm. Like this is you, you know, in order to make it scalable, you need systems, you need processes, you figure out property management. You know, it doesn't make sense to be out there cutting 15 lawns on a weekend. You've got to have, you know, built into your numbers, some sort of a buffer to be able to pay someone to cut your lawns. Because you might be able to do it at five, but you can't at 50 and you certainly can't at 100. So you yeah. start when you're small and you build those systems and processes so that you don't burn out and kill yourself in the process of trying to build your, you know, your empire in real estate. So this might get a couple of dislikes, yet I don't even cut my own lawn. And I'm happy to pay somebody to do it. Yet yeah. my wife is frugal and she won't pay anybody to cut the lawn, so she cuts the lawn. So I might get some dislikes here because of that. I don't know, but my wife cuts the lawn. I, I offered to put down uh, AstroTurf. 
it's been a lot, the, the, I offered for that too. I'm like, I'm happy to do that. No weeds, no nothing. Don't have to cut it. Always green. Yeah. And that didn't fly either. So yeah, lawns, it, and main, gar, garden maintenance is, is definitely her. Absolutely. And, and, you know, you want to balance it with, you know, someone who says, this is what I like to do in my downtime. I find this relaxing. This is how, you know, I decompress from the week. And that's different. But I'm the same way as you. Um, when we started educating ourselves, when we took our, our courses with Rich Dad, um, I turned to my husband afterwards and he had, we had always been cleaning our house ourselves. And I said to him, you know, look at how much we've invested in our education. It doesn't make sense for us to be, you know, cutting the lawn and, and cleaning our house. We're better off paying someone to do that. And the best thing we can do with our time is reinvest it either in ourselves in terms of personal development or invested in the business in terms of looking for new deals, looking for opportunities, networking with people, looking for joint venture partners. Like it doesn't make sense to be cutting the lawn and shoveling the snow when you know there is nobody else who can do what you're doing. So our philosophy is you pay people to do what other people can do and the stuff that nobody else can do, the stuff that's the highest and best use of your time, that's what you do yourself. That's what you make a priority in your life and focus well, on. Well, and I had a rule in my business um, if somebody could do something 80% as well as I could, I would give it away. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then you focus on business development and then you're focusing on your business, not in your business. Right. Exactly. Yeah. hundred percent agree with you there. Well, we've kind of gone down this road. So let's talk a bit about the coaching. What does that look like? I mean, my particular coaching programs, um, I like to think I'm, I'm a little bit unique because my coaching programs, you know, I taught for Rich Dad for eight years and I had a tremendous, I was so appreciative of the opportunity to meet so many students from across the country who were just starting their journey in real estate. And um, when I resigned from Rich Dad and moved into my coaching program, what I really wanted to do was the pieces that I wasn't able to do as a trainer. So what I do is I focus uh, on where a client is at that particular time and all my, all my coaching programs are customized. So we take a really good look, you know, our first couple of weeks are where are you at right now? Where are your personal finances? What are your, um, you know, what are your goals? What can you do in terms of financing on your own before you need to start looking at joint venture partners? So we do a really deep dive. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? And then we look at where, what are the pieces that are missing? Everybody's journey, I think of as a puzzle. So some people, you know, they're sort of missing the asset protection piece and they don't know how to structure. Other people are kind of missing, you know, the property management piece. Maybe they've already got a couple of properties. So we'll look at their portfolio and say, what's performing? What's not? What do we need to adjust? Maybe you need to put in a basement apartment somewhere. Maybe you've got a couple of condos and you need to sell those so that you positively cash flow. That'll give you the opportunity to buy four more properties. Yeah. So once we sort of know where we are, where we want to go, we look at the puzzle pieces, we fill them in with education, support, exercise activities. And my goal is by the time my cl clients are done with me, I want them to have at least one new property. So we've gone through the entire process from start to finish, but it is 100% customized for where they are and exactly what they need at that moment in time. Nice. Nice. And I, and I think I'm remiss. I, I forgot to mention that you guys are investing in and managing properties in Kirkland, Kirkland Lake, right? For yeah, we do, we do. We do rent to owns uh, in a number of communities in Ontario. Um, we've done investments in actually most of the provinces in Canada, but we keep coming back again and again and again to Ontario just because although the Residential Tenancy Act is a little more in favor of the tenants here than it is in some of the other markets, overall, we feel it's a more stable market and we know what we're working with. And sometimes there's an advantage to being a bigger fish in a smaller pond as opposed to you know sort of being spread out all over the place i feel like the real estate market in ontario is probably one of the most stable ones in the country yeah where, where else have you guys bought uh halifax uh, we have quite a few properties still that we own in new brunswick uh, multi-units uh, but we've done rent to owns in new brunswick and halifax uh newfoundland um alberta quebec yep oh I, yeah. everybody always asks me mark why don't you invest in quebec and i'm like uh listen i barely understand the ontario rental rules i i i don't even know if i could go and learn those ones so yeah everybody and, and, was july 1st right 
Yep. And Quebec is even more heavily in favor of the tenant than Ontario is. And, you know, if you're not 100% on top of your game with paperwork and that kind of thing, then the lease automatically renews exactly the same terms, exactly the same rate, everything else. So if you're not giving your tenants notice far enough in advance, you know, if you're going by the Ontario rules, all of a sudden you look at Quebec and, hey, guess what? You've got tenants there at the same rate for another year, even if your expenses have gone up. Yeah. And it's much more difficult to, uh, to evict in Quebec as well. So. Yeah. Have you done anything out west or... Yeah, we've done some stuff in Alberta. We've looked in BC. Um, I just find that the returns are much harder to find in BC than they are in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And um, the stuff in Alberta that we did, you know, we we sort of we closed it out a few years ago. So it was when you know the markets were heading down, and and um, there was just a lot of a lot of challenges with the Alberta market. You got ahead of the market. It's not good right now. And I don't like to disparage any market across the board because I think, you know, if you're, if you're resourceful and determined, I think you can find deals pretty in pretty much every market, but I find like there's more deals uh, in Ontario just because our market is more stable and we can count on it over time to go upwards. I mean, um, the Alberta market has always seen, you know, higher, has always, you know, increased more and dropped more than a lot of the other markets in Canada. Definitely a lot more volatility. So absolutely. Let me, so are you, like, I know you're in Kirkland Lake. Is it mainly secondary markets like that? Like, I would almost call the Kirkland Lake a tertiary market. Tertiary market, yeah. yeah. So is that, is that like, so when you go out to like New, Newfoundland or uh, New Brunswick or, or um, uh, Nova Scotia, are you in like the major centers? Are you in the tertiary markets? Like what's... Yeah, so it's, it's so um, New Brunswick, I would, we're in St. John. So, I mean, although it wouldn't be size wise, wouldn't be considered a tertiary market, certainly in terms of appreciation, it would be. Yeah. Um, so it really depends on the strategy. And I think that's, you know, one of the challenges that a lot of investors have when they're starting out is that they sort of, they pick their strategy and they pick their market and then they try and smush them together. And not every strategy works in every market. You know, rent to owns are, it's very challenging to make them work in a market like Toronto and Vancouver. Vancouver because you know you got in some cases you got the bidding wars but you know the fair market rent is not enough to offset the cost and then when you look at you know little markets tertiary markets it's hard to get the appreciation to provide the return so rent to owns are really best in secondary markets but you know people could try and and sort of the round the square peg in the round hole thing without going okay is it more important that i choose my market because i want to do something close to me or is it more important that i choose my strategy because this is a strategy that i really like and i know and i'm comfortable with and if that's the case then i'm going to go out and look for the closest market where it works yeah and i think that's a, a challenge a lot of investors have and that's how sometimes we get into like income properties that are negative cash flowing for people because they really wanted to do an income property and they tried to do it where they live. Yeah, and it's funny. I, I mean, somebody had commented on one of the videos um, about, I think it was a CMHC video about never being able to afford a home in, in Oakville. And I'm like, who cares? You're renting, right? I go, you, they can only raise the rent 2% a year, continue renting, and then take the money we're going to use to buy and go buy in a secondary market. Like, look at St. Catharines, look at Brantford, look at, you know, these other markets, smaller markets, and go buy a couple income properties, you know, and, and have your rent cover, like, have the rent from those properties cover your mortgage and, and away you, or your rent and, and away you go, right? Like, I, I'm like, why are you in this narrow um, tunnel? where I just have to have home ownership rather than rental property ownership. Yeah. And, and it really comes down to, you know, do you want to, would you rather live where you want to live? Like in a, you know, a more urban market like Toronto or whatever it is, or do you want to own a home? And typically there's some sort of compromise somewhere between the two. And um, there's definitely a school of thought among a lot of sort of higher level investors that I've chatted with, where it's very much, you know, you, you buy, you rent the home in the, in the, you know, market where you want to live. And then you turn around and you take all that money that you would have spent on your mortgage and you put it into investment properties and you use it to generate income. And at the end of the day, when you look at the projections and you run the true numbers, you actually come out farther ahead. Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, I, I think the only reason I own a home right now is because my wife, that, that, may, that gives her the comfort level, right? So, 
Yeah. And when, you know, when our spouses aren't involved in real estate, like I, um, quite a few of my coaching clients are actually couples that I work with. So yeah. everybody has a different risk tolerance and a different perspective on things. And right. generally there is one person in the partnership who's a little more risk adverse than the other one. And the idea, you know, we're all, most of us are raised, you know, you go to school, you work hard, you get a job, you, you buy a home, you have a family, you retire and you die. Like yeah, that's the way most of us are right. 60, 64, 66, whatever. And yeah. Pay, and then you, pension. yeah. And then you look at, you know, I don't know if your parents were impacted, but my parents certainly were impacted, you know, 2008. And then, um, you know, last year and, and more recently this year, of course, my, my mom's, um, my mom's stocks took a real nosedive. Like they, she really got hurt. So yeah. if I didn't have the company and I wasn't able to help her out, um, that was a large part of my reason for even starting in real estate because I wanted the opportunity to be able to help the people that I care most about. So if you don't have those kinds of buffers, you know, if you have everything for your retirement and stocks and mutual funds, then it can be a really bumpy road. For sure. For sure. So, I mean, I get what, I guess where I get from this conversation is, you know, kind of get it. Like if you're in an area and your strategy is not working, Number one, you can change your strategy or number two, you can go look elsewhere for opportunity. I mean, like for instance, I mean, I've been running numbers on stuff in Saskatchewan. I haven't gone out East yet, which uh, I have I, I, been thinking about it. It's like Halifax and, and that type of thing. I haven't done it. I've been running numbers in Tampa Bay and Arizona. Um, and, and it's just because again, it's a different strategy than what I'm doing in Hamilton. And the problem is Hamilton just keeps providing deals. Like, I, I mean, I got a 66 unit today that's literally right beside one of my other properties. It will give me a huge swath of land that at some point I can just tear everything down and build a tower maybe when they zone it. Um, or, you know, and, and I got a 19 unit today that just, you know, crossed my plate and, and the deals just keep coming. That's pre pretty amazing because most investors I talk to right now, they're having a lot of challenges finding those bigger buildings. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, everybody says that. And, I, and it's funny, I think, it, I think it was in Mike and Mark's group, they put up, uh, what's your biggest challenge as, as an investor trying to buy an apartment building? A lot of people said that. And mine was, well, not, not buying every deal that crosses my plate, right? Like that's... Yeah. And, and I think that that really highlights the importance of, you know, we talked a bit earlier, but being a bigger fish in a smaller pond, you know, digging right into your market, making those connections, building that network of people so that, you know, you're not cruising around on MLS looking for every deal that, you know, stuff actually, I mean, we've had people walk into our office and, and literally throw keys on our desk and, and say, I'm done. I'm out. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to be a landlord. Like here's the keys. Let's figure out a price. Cause I'm out of here. Yeah, and well, when I you mean, have that relationship, then it opportunities come to you. Yeah. Well, and I was just thinking like Kirkland Lake, I mean, obviously your price point is probably a little bit lower. So, you know, a lot of these people would look and say, Oh, I own a million dollar home in Toronto. I can go to Kirkland Lake and buy a 20 unit for a million dollars. A million dollars, right? And I'm sure a couple of years ago it was maybe six hundred. Yeah. You've had price appreciation from thirty to fifty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for for the house, my house in Toronto that's a little semi-detached, I can buy a twenty unit in Kirkland Lake. Yeah. Producing how many thousands of dollars a month in income and cash flow. Right. Well, and, and the thing is, I guess, so they can jump right into that twenty unit, but they don't have the business set up behind them, right? They don't yeah. have like and, and that's I guess for, I mean, it took me a while to get into multi-units is I never had the business set up to be able to do it. Now, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm still developing that. Like I'm literally just opening my own property management company to manage my own properties. Um, I mean, we're filming this on June 24th. Uh, I think it'll probably come out around July 6th, uh, maybe next week. We'll, we'll see what happens. This might be a Canada Day special. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, and literally it's been 16 years and I've never, other than like the first three months where I managed my own properties, I haven't managed anything. So now, you know, I'm, I'm bringing that back in house again. And, and it's now I'm hiring somebody to build the model, build the system for me to be able to 
run that. Like I'm not involved. I won't be involved in the day to day at all. Yeah. But again, you know, when you get to your level, it is very much, you know, you're working on the business, not in the business. You know, you have the people who have the skill set and, and not everyone is amazing at everything. So, you know, you pick the people, you, you staff your company with the people who have the skills that you don't or the people who, you know, have a particular skill set like, you know, your property manager. You're going to pick someone who's great at, you know, problem solving and customer service and, you know, detail oriented and all those kinds of things um, and then you're just providing the, the training and then eventually the the guidance to support them but it really is important that you choose your people carefully um, you know we discovered with property management we've been running our own company for about 10 years now and uh, the people that you choose can make or break your reputation and if you have someone who is not enhancing your reputation but is actually damaging it then it becomes harder to rent properties so you have to keep in mind that, you know, your tenants are, are your number one priority. Um, if you have no tenants, then you have no income. And it doesn't matter what, you know, how many doors you have or how many doors you don't have. Um, if you're not generating, you know, if, if you're not attracting the highest and best possible tenant for that particular unit, then you're, you're missing out. 100% for sure. Yeah. And, and the systems and the processes, I mean, for tenants, keep in mind, it starts right from the beginning. It starts from, you know, did someone pick up the phone? Did someone return their message? Or, you know, what do the systems and processes look like in your property management company? You know, are there still people who are, um, you know, handwriting receipts or, you know, giving out paper applications? Like how difficult is it for someone to become one of your tenants? Yeah. And what is the whole process like start to finish? You know, do you have a little welcome basket in the apartment that says, welcome to your new home. We're so happy to have you here. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really going above and beyond because there's a lot of people out there with rental units yeah, and true. they don't have to, they don't have to rent from you. Well, I mean, Hamilton has a like vacancy rate of less than 1%. So mm -hmm. they kind of have to actually, if they're, if they're looking, you know, it's still, yeah. it's still, it's still a pretty tight rental market out there. So. Yeah, but I would imagine the best caliber tenants might be able to choose between a couple of units. 100% they can, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's why we try to up upgrade our, our units to make condo-like units to get that, the top level tenants. Yeah. And, and we do the same thing, you know, in Kirkland Lake, we've recognized there's a bit of a shortage of sort of the higher end, really nice units. So when we get the opportunity to go in and do some work, you know, we do things that, you know, other people might not normally do like something simple, like putting in a backsplash in a kitchen. It just looks so nice, but you know, a lot of the things that we do, it's a great value add for the tenant, but it's also protection for us. You know, a lot of times when sinks are leaking and, you know, you have to paint and that kind of thing, maybe it's dirt and grime, you know, the kitchen sink is an area that gets a lot of traffic. So you put up a backsplash, you seal everything properly, and, you know, it's really easy for the tenants to keep clean and it's really easy for you to clean in between. Plus the unit looks really nice. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, again, you're going to get a better quality tenant and you know, maybe they pay a little bit more yet. They're going to stay longer. They're going to treat your unit nicer. I mean, it's just like the, the, your maintenance on that property goes down because you get a better quality tenant. Absolutely. And, and the turnover as well, you know, most of us factor in some form of vacancy. So you might say, well, the vacancy rate in your market is, you know, less than 1%. But what that doesn't account for is when a tenant moves out and there's work that needs to be done and then the work is completed and then you need to find a new tenant. So it's, it's reasonable to expect two to three months there um, where you don't have a tenant. So even though the demand is high in your market, you still got to factor in this time for the turnover between tenants when you're doing renovations. Definitely. For sure. And I mean, that, 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 again, that's my strategy is when tenant turnover, I'm, you know, going in, renovating these units and, you know, sometimes increasing rents by a hundred percent. Yeah. Depending on how long the tenant's been there. We have one tenant right now who's been in his unit for 43 years. You know what? I, I, I was trying to remember how long I had one in Cornwall. Um, they'd been there a heck of a long time. It was yeah. like, yeah, her and her cats were there for a long time. <laughs> Anyways, so what? So Kirkland Lake. I, I don't know the market that well, or at all, at all, at all. What's the cap rate up there? 
what, what's what's an average cap rate? I know I know that that's a loaded question. It depends because in Kirkland Lake, when you buy buildings, a lot of it is you're paying for the condition. Like in Toronto, people buy because it's a 40 unit building. Is it in good condition? Is it in great condition? Is it in bad condition? The difference in price really isn't that much. Uh, in my experience, but in Kirkland Lake, like, you know, when the buildings are in lower conditions, um, then you're definitely paying less money for them. So I would say, depending on the condition, you're looking probably anywhere between nine and 11 percent. Uh, nine and 11 percent cap rate. Yeah. That's unreal. And you're going to manage this for me. Absolutely. I would very much like to. OK. And, I, and I'm <laughs> sure like you're going to CMHC financing on this stuff when you're yeah, okay. you start, absolutely can. Yep, you can, you know, the bigger buildings, you start looking at commercial financing and you can, we, um, we did an 11 unit a couple of years ago and 15% uh, down, 85% loan to value. Hmm. All right. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're piquing my interest. I don't know if anybody on, on, on the channel is going to be interested, but, uh, you know, uh, we're going to put that thought. The thing to keep in mind is that it's a tertiary market. So what you're basically doing is you're trading potential appreciation for cash flow. Yep. So my goal when I buy properties is I'm always looking for a minimum dollar amount in cash flow. And I know that it's not going to appreciate like a building down south. Yeah. I'm okay with that because instead of banking on future appreciation, which you access, you know, when you refinance a property or when you sell the property, what I'm looking for is cash flow to be able to support uh, myself, my family, to be able to pursue the activities that I want to pursue. But that being said, I don't, I don't ever want to take so much money out of a building that I'm not um, investing in my tenants, that I'm not making sure that they're comfortable, that they're safe, that they have what they need, and that you know they really want to live in my units because they are you know among the best units in Kirkland Lake. So my reputation is important to me too. So I'm never going to, you know, take every penny out of the corporation or out of the building and, and not leave something there for, you know, doing renovations and, and fixes appropriately. So what are you, like, are you seeing rent increases year over year though? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like what's your average rent, rent increase right now? For a two bedroom in good shape, we're looking at 900 plus hydro. And what was that last year average type thing? Um, eight twenty-five, maybe. Wow! So you feel like you've had a good eight, nine percent increase. Yeah, yeah, for for sure. And um, it's so why your buildings have almost doubled in value in the last couple of years, bro. Yeah. Yeah, we also do um, some forced appreciation stuff as well. Like we do like to, you know, fix up the units between tenants. It's not very often that we'll just flip what, from one to the other if there's work needed in a unit. Yeah. Um, but definitely, uh, it, it, I think it's important to really know your market and, and be able to gauge what the need is. Like a couple of years ago, we identified that um, we really needed to have some apartments that were higher end and furnished higher end for some of the executives that were coming into town. So we did a, probably about a dozen units we furnished as higher end executives. So, you know, there's somewhere nice for people to come because it was definitely an issue that there wasn't a lot to choose from for people who you know didn't want to have a beautiful new newer hotel in town the microtel and um, most of the executives were staying there but you know you only want to eat takeout food and, and cook in a kitchenette for you know a certain period of time you don't want to spend years doing that so yeah, for sure. it, it's identifying needs in your market and and being um, nimble enough to be able to step in and address them before your competition does yeah. well I mean so I mean, this has been great. I do. I mean, we could probably talk for hours and I do yeah. like to keep it under 30 minutes yet. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, you just had an event last week, right? Yeah, we had a fire last week. <laughs> So it, um, it, it wasn't, you know, anytime you have anything like that, a, a lot of investors, this is kind of, as we talked about before, this is kind of their worst nightmare. Um, for us, once we ascertain that our tenants are safe, that their pets are all safe, and, and you know, that all the systems worked the way they were supposed to, so everybody got out without any injury or loss of life, then you sort of start the process of rebuilding. And it's, um, you know, it's time consuming and it's labor intensive, but, you know, a lot of times when you undertake a renovation, so in this particular case, uh, it was a 15 unit building 
and uh, four of the units are going to be down for you know three to six months depending on how long it takes insurance to sort of for everything to wind through but those units okay. when they're it's done I mean, 12 months but okay that's yeah. just speaking from experience i've had um i've had two fire claims and my my fa my well i have two favorite stories i guess now i bought a 20 unit building in hamilton and i closed on a friday and on the saturday they had a propane canister explode on one of the balconies no. and i'm sitting at my cottage and i'm getting phone calls and i'm like uh well what's going on and i'm like hey can you drive by and see what's going on and yeah. i got finally put on to the fire guy and he's like Oh yeah, like there's no structural. Everybody can go back in. That nothing went inside, and I just had a scar, like a, a scorch mark on the side of the building for a while before I pressure washed it off. And there yeah. was no lasting damage. But a propane canister, a day after I bought it or it closed, yeah, it exploded. My, and and that my, highlights the importance of good insurance, right? Well, so the first one I ever had in my life. This is what I went through it. I had a fourplex in in Cornwall and it had a fire and it was a complete write off. And we bought that thing for like $70,000, but the rebuild on it with a whole bunch of other stuff, I think it came to 480 or something. And you're sitting there looking, well, it's not gonna be worth 480 when they're done. And they're like, hey, well, we'll just cut you a check for four, 440. Yeah. And we're like, uh, okay. And then like, what do, is the property ours still? And they're like, yeah, you can do whatever you want with the property. So we could have rebuilt it ourselves. Yeah. Or we just went ahead and sold the, the land for like $30,000. And I think the guy who bought it actually like said, oh, I can, I can fix it. So. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's um, it really, you know, anytime you have fires, floods, anything like that, it highlights the importance of making sure you have the right type of insurance. Like you need to have the special policies that are for real estate investors, not, you know, well, this company insures my home, so I'll just get them to throw a policy on. Like you're not going to have loss of rents. You're not going to have, you know, vacancy. You're not going to have the same type or the same quality of coverage when you go with sort of those other things. You want to make sure you have the right type of insurance so that when there is a catastrophic loss like this that it's not leaving you all of a sudden scrambling trying to come up with funds to you know continue to pay the mortgage and and all those kinds of things well i mean I, you know I, I hear from a lot of new investors oh you had a fire oh man that's so that's so bad and i'm like well i mean not really i mean i have my favorite tenant now the insurance company paying my rent i have no expenses with those units and literally you, they're going to pay for to renovate the unit mm -hmm. right and and not even upgrade it's just i need to put in what was there so i mean there's kitchens bathrooms and of course you're going to make them nice um and if you do that right like i mean when you're working with the companies that they recommend they're pretty high in price so if you can bring in your own or do something then you know there's some money to be made when this is all happening right it's it's i call it a crisis opportunity right so you gotta take advantage of the christatunity christatunity <laughs> i'm gonna have to use that and give you credit in the future my pleasure anytime it's like a coronation yeah <laughs> it's like the covid 15 what yeah <laughs> I got those too. <laughs> That's awesome. I like that. Yeah. And I think a lot of, you know, people's success as real estate investors, it comes down to mindset. It comes down to resiliency. It comes down to perspective. You know, you can be, you know, devastated and overwhelmed and, and everything else, or you can look for the opportunities in everything that happens because make no mistake, there is an opportunity in every single thing that happens. Yeah. And it really depends on what your mindset is and whether you, you know, I mean, that, that isn't to say that, you know, you don't spend some time sort of, you know, processing and there's times where, you know, depending on what the situation is where, you know, you're upset and everything else, but you can't wallow in it. You can't stay in it. You need to pick yourself up and, and uh, bounce back again, bigger and badder than you were before. And I think one of the biggest things is, is if you've never experienced it, phone a friend, right? A hundred percent. Like I had, uh, I had George, um, George, um, oh, geez, he was just on. Anyways, um, El Masri, and he's wellof.ca or whatever he is, Wellof Podcast. I think you, have you been on that one? No, I haven't actually. 
It's a good one. Check it out. Um, but so he just bought a, a property in Welland and they have bed bugs. And I'm like, as soon as I heard that, I'm like, oh man, I, I wrote an article for Canadian real estate magazine way back when that they didn't publish saying you're not a real um, land, you're not a real uh, real estate investor until you've had bed bugs. <laughs> that must've been very unpopular. <laughs> well, they didn't publish it. I thought it was a great article. I mean, but it, it just goes to show you like it's, it's that adverse uh, adversity, right? Like you go, you go through those, ad, ad, that adversity and like, you know, you go, you buy properties that have bed bugs. I mean, I used to buy hoarder houses, crack houses. Like they were, I thought they were the best because they had the most opportunity and less people were looking for them. I mean, yep. I've evolved in my career and now I buy a lot nicer buildings. It, it's, it, it's so funny. I mean, the, the person I hired for my property management company were taking over a 30 unit building July 9th. And she's like, this is a nice building. And I'm like, yeah, this is the worst one I bought in a while but it's all concrete construction. It's, it's, it's simple. It's, it's clean. Like mm -hmm. there's no, like in a good area. And, and that's just where I've evolved to because I find that that's just less work than buying a wood frame one. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I remember a couple of weeks ago, I, I, um, I have a high performance coach and I called him and I was having a, bad day and I was kind of grumbling and grousing and he and I said to him you know I, I said you know sometimes I feel like I'm dealing with you know other people's manure and only I didn't use that word of course yeah. um, and he said to me you know what he goes the best things grow from manure he goes when you are feeling like that he said that means it's time for you to figure out what you need, need to do differently there's something that's not working figure out what that is put in place a system or a process to address it and he said the best things come from manure and I was like you're so right. And five minutes later, I was like, okay, what are we doing now? How do we fix this? How do we address this? You know, what do we need to do to come back? So like magic mushrooms, right? That <laughs> I don't know much about those, but it, pretty mm -hmm. much everything grows in manure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, and that's, so, I mean, I have a saying like in, in the real estate world, like in Keller Williams, there's a saying that if you're stressed out about something, it's because number one, you either don't have a system or number two, you're missing a person in your life. To take yeah, hundred percent agree with that. That's absolutely a very true statement. I agree. All right. So what's your final words of wisdom for everybody who's made it to the end of the YouTube channel, other than subscribe and smash the like button. <laughs> now you're putting me on the spot. Um, I, I think it would really be your real, your journey in real estate is your own. You know, take a step back, take stock. And if you're missing pieces, if you're missing people, if you're missing systems and processes, reach mm -hmm. out to people who are doing what you want to do and talk to them about their success. You know, there's different ways you can educate yourself in real estate. You can do the, you know, the podcasts and, and that kind of thing. Um, you can work with a larger company or you can hire a coach and, uh, you know, reach out to, to whichever solution you think is going to provide the best opportunity. I do provide people with the opportunity to do a 30 minute discovery call with me. So if you're stuck on something and you, you need a hand with something and you want to talk about your puzzle, then give me a call and I'd be happy to sit down and chat it out with you. How do people find you? Oh, well, I'm pretty easy to find. I don't hide. Um, so I am on Facebook, um, Elizabeth Kelly coaching and consulting or consulting and coaching, sorry. Um, you can also email me, elizabeth at ekconsulting.ca. And those are probably the best ways to reach me. Perfect. I do have a cell phone number, but I don't usually give it out. Oh, we, we won't put that on YouTube. Okay, uh, that's good. Yeah, I, yeah, I might get spammed to death. Yeah, so we'll put the, we'll put the link to the Facebook down below. Uh, it'll, be in the, it'll be in the description. So if you want to go follow and, and get in touch with, with Elizabeth, you're, it'll be down there, guys. So. Thank you. And if you don't mind, uh, I would love to have people join our Facebook group. Lee Moore Markman and I have a, a group, Canadian Real Estate Wealth Inve or Canadian Real Estate Investing Mastermind. And we would absolutely love to have people jump in and join the conversation, talk about our challenges and our successes. It's a great Facebook page. I mean, I'm on it all the time. Uh, so again, we'll, we'll put that link in the description below. So go follow those two and join those. It's a wealth of information. Like there's thousands and thousands of years of experience in that group so good point yeah thank you so much mark for the opportunity it was great to connect with you again yeah great to talk to you again too i mean it's hard with kirkland lake i mean we would have had to do this over zoom anyways with covid or no covid so absolutely thank you good
All right.